Okay, so um, Simon's um, obviously uh, talked quite elegantly about the mechanistic um, side of uh, uh, regurgitation, uh, you know, mainly focusing on the type ones. Um, the remit of this whole session is, is assessment in the perioperative setting, um, and I'm going to bring you back to the sort of um, uh, to that setting to, to go through the type two uh, regurgitation. Um, type two regurgitation will account for the majority of the patients that are coming in through um, surgical hands for mitral valve uh, repair surgery. Um, uh, this figure is from an audit. Um, five or six years ago, which and I, I suspect it hasn't really changed much if you look through up and down the country in new surgical cohorts. Um, and because such complex mitral valves are being successfully repaired, we as um, cardiologists, uh, as anaesthetists, as surgeons, we all actually have to understand the mechanisms and talk to each other in the same language, which um, which, which makes me kind of believe that the Carpentier classification itself, the type 1, the, the 2, the 3, the Bs and the As, actually make matters very confused. Certainly I don't have the brain power to keep remembering which type fits what kind of mechanism. So I like to um, describe things more descriptively um, and, um, you know, hopefully, um, uh, therefore, accurately. Um, when we're looking at type 2s, um, we, when, when we actually assess the valves, we're actually looking at three different things in the perioperative setting and in also in the preoperative setting. Uh, why is the valve leaking? Um, uh, where is it leaking from? And can this type of valve be repaired? Now, why is the mitral valve leaking? Uh, so just a, a brief reminder, uh, I'm sure this is um, complete revision for most people, most of you. Um, there are two degenerative processes uh, that we see commonly in the operative room um, for mitral repair. One is uh, the description, uh, description being prolapse, and this is where you have elongation uh, if this is a, a schematic diagram of the blue muscles, um, uh, cords, and the mitral leaflet, uh, and the left atrium, where you have elongation of the cords, you have redundancy of the leaflets, and if one leaflet is um, prolapsing rather than another, you have eccentric mitral regurgitation. And as you all know, the eccentric regurgitation actually goes away from pathology. Now, with with large amounts of prolapse, you can actually still see fairly competent valves. And I'm sure um, you know, you've all seen this. Anatomically, a valve might look quite abnormal with large redundant um, parts of the leaflets, but the prolapse can actually be provoked uh, by uh, vasoconstriction um, from your perspective, but from, from a preoperative setting, we can actually make mitral regurgita regurgitation or unmask the degree of mitral regurgitation by actually exercising patients. So although some prolapses don't look to be associated with much regurgitation, you can actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's a provocation that you may have to do in patients. But you can see that there's no ruptured cords that are associated with that prolapse. Flail, on the other hand, is another description that's used when, when cords are actually ruptured. Now, this can be a, a continuum, so you can actually start with prolapse over the years, over decades, in fact, in some people, and then you can, sudden, you can have a sudden deterioration in symptoms, which is usually an indicator that the mitral regurgitation has become much more acute because of a ruptured cord. So we do see this um, commonly. Now, with flail segments, so as soon as you see a ruptured cord, Anatomically, that should trigger you to think that you're actually seeing severe mitral regurgitation. So if you're not seeing severe mitral regurgitation but seeing that anatomy, then you're either missing the regurgitation on color and you have to search harder, um, or um, you know, the anatomy, the, the flail cords are not actually to the primary cords. They might be to the secondary or strut cords. But if you have a primary cord that's flailed so that one leaflet overrides another, you usually do see eccentric severe mitral regurgitation going away from the pathology. And now here's an example of complete overriding of a leaflet with some ruptured cords that are attached at the ends. 
and I'm sure you've seen all of these. More important part of uh, the functional assessment is actually where the valve is leaking from, and this, this does get um, people very um, hot under the collar because it's, it, it is actually quite a difficult thing to, to do from TOE. TOE gives you sort of 2D cut planes and you have to conceptualize that in your brain and, and think about it in, in 3D um, unless you actually have 3D echo uh, available. But when we are thinking about whether the valve is leaking from P1 or, or A2, um, we, don't need, we do need to know our anatomy. Um, and Carpentier um, set the segmentalization up of the mitral valve several years ago. Um, and divided the posterior leaflet, as you all know, into the three natural scallops that it has, with the left atrial appendage uh, being uh, closest to P1 and then onto P3, and then corresponding A1 to A3, and the anterolateral commissure being between A1 and P1, and the posterior medial commissure between A3 and P3. Now, when you look at um, um, echocardiography in general, if you look at a transthoracic view, um, of a short axis of the mitral valve, you're actually not seeing the surgeon's eye view at all because you're actually visualizing the, the mitral valve cross-section from the left ventricular aspect and not the atrial aspect. And similarly, if you look at a cross-sectional view on TOE, you're again looking at it from the ventricle rather than the atrium. So really, only 3D echocardiography can actually simulate the surgeon's eye view that, you, that the surgeons are used to seeing. And when we actually display 3D um, echo, this is quite an old style 3D echo with multiple sort of um, uh, lines that you can see. Uh, it takes a long time to do, but now it's at the touch of a button. And most uh, commercial machines that are available in theater, I believe, have th are 3D enabled. But you can actually visualize it in, a, in the same way that the surgeon visualizes it. Now, if you don't have 3D available, you do have to go back to your TOE views, and this is where it becomes very complex. As um, uh, you will have um, heard for, if you were here in the, in the earlier session, the 3D probe can be manipulated in various um, angles, so the omniplane angle is important, but what is equally important is the vertical distance that you're in. Um, so pushing in, pulling out, all of those advances are very, very important in getting the right cut planes. Rotational elements are very important, not so much for the mitral valve, because the mitral valve lends itself very easily to sort of, without much rotational um, uh, manipulation, it lends itself very easily to TOE images because it, the TOE probe sits just behind the left atrium and the mitral valve is the big structure right in front of the left atrium as you view it. Um, but basically, um, there are lots of manipulations you can do up and down um, uh, and uh, with your omniplane. But when I'm teaching um, cut planes to recognize on TOE, I, I try and simplify things by saying that you've got increments of 30 degrees usually, um, if, but if you miss out the 30 degree view and just stick to the zero, the 60, the 90, and the 120, you will cover the mitral valve in, in most of its entirety. So let's talk about the zero degree view. Um, so this is, if I was a TOE probe, I'd be sitting um, parallel to that picture, looking at the mitral valve in that kind of, uh, from, from a parallel position. Now, if I actually send out a, f a zero degree fan from the TOE, um, it, and, and, and are sitting quite high up, so vertically high up, my zero degree fan will actually be cutting through the anterolateral commissure. So, if you have a five chamber view and come up the way, so almost the mitral valve closes off and, and you're seeing the annulus, you are actually very close to the anterolateral commissure, okay? So five chamber pulling up quite high. Now if you bring it down vertically and you are actually at the true five chamber, you've got your aortic valve on one side. Now this is, the TOE's display is right to left reversed. So from, from the anatomical view, the aortic valve will be on the other side but on this view, the aortic valve is on the left, displayed on the left. So when you're actually lower down, but still seeing the aortic valve, you are usually cutting the valve through A1 and P1, A1 being closest to your aortic valve and P1 on the other side. Now, if you go down vertically further and actually don't see the aortic valve anymore, you are in your four chamber view, so you'll be cutting, the, cutting it through A2 and P2. So those zero degree planes in different vertical positioning will actually give you quite a number of uh, valve segments quite easily. So this is very achievable in most of your TOEs. 
What is not achievable is if you go down any further, you don't necessarily see P3 and A3 because you actually disappear in most people into the stomach and at the gastroesophageal junction your views disappear. Okay. So those, this is hopefully just revision for you. Now when you actually uh, change the angle to a six degree plane, you're cutting the valve along the closure line or along the commissure and that's why it's called a, a commissural view. But actually it's a misnomer, the name is a misnomer because you don't actually see the posture medial commissure nor the anterolateral commissure. What you do see is a left atrial appendage and then you see P1, A2 in the middle and P3 on the side. Now, going up to a 90 degree position, you are orthogonal to the zero degree view, so vertically down. You, will, you should be expecting to cut through A1 and A2 and then P3 at the end. So on the TOE picture, so you're 90 degrees, you see a long anterior, so anterior leaflet and a, and a smaller posterior leaflet, and the base of that anterior leaflet is usually A1, the coaptation point is at A2, and on the other side you see P3. Now if you rotate that to bring the aortic valve into your cut plane, you get something like this. So we're just going to start to rotate until the aortic valve comes in. Now once you've actually achieved that rotation, then you can cut through the posture medial commissure. Okay? So that's really a commissural view because you're actually looking at the commissure. Okay? So two chamber, rotated, and you can just see the commissure on the other side. In this particular case, you can also see some ruptured cords and some pathology. So another 30 degree increment takes you to the 120 view. And then on this view, it's very easy to recognize. You've got the aortic valve, and you've got basically a cut line through the middle of the valve, A2 and P2. So this is an easy one to remember long axis view of the aortic valve and the LV, and you've got A2 and P2 on the other side. Now, you can actually also look at these things from the trans transgastric windows, but because prolapses and flails, so type, type 2 regurgitation, has the pathology coming into the left atrium, that, that pathology is not very detectable from the left ventricular approach. Okay, which is what the gastric views give you. But it still can be very, very useful, particularly if you've got multiple jets. So you can actually interrogate that with color and you can have two jets on either side of P2, for example. So it can still be quite useful to use the, 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 the transgastric views. But in general, the mitral um, valve can be assessed from the esophagus. So you now know the pathologies that you're dealing with in type 2. You now know how to segmentalize the mitral valve and, and tell me where that pathology is. Um, what you now have to decide is what's repairable. Now, that's actually quite a difficult question to answer because it will be completely dependent on the surgeons that you work with. Now, in our uh, institution, there are some surgeons that are so experienced that they don't even need a TOE preoperatively. They can actually work from your transthoracic um, echoes and say, okay, if it's a posterior leaflet problem, I don't really care whether it's P3 or P1 or P2, I'll take them to surgery and I'll uninspect it and do what I need to do. But there are other surgeons that will only take on P2 prolapses or P2 flails because that's easier repair to deliver they have less experience and they want full um, segmental analysis beforehand. Okay, so it will very much dependent, repairability is very much dependent on your surgeon and, and your relationship with them uh, and your communication with them. But in general, repairs are easier for the posterior leaflet and when there's only limited pathology involved. Repairs become more difficult when there's anterior leaflet uh, involvement there's multi-segment pathology, and the, um, the leaflets are actually um, uh, problematic at the commissural regions. You're still in the operating room. The surgeon has uh, repaired a valve. Let's have a look at some pictures to see whether the repair is actually successful or not. So, in this particular case, do you feel that the repair is successful? No. <laughs> It's a bit too successful. Okay, so this is mitral stenosis, and, and what sort of mitral stenosis would you allow a patient to leave the OR with? So the standard uh, guidelines actually say that 
you know, this has to be patient-specific, patient but in general, if you've got a mitral valve area which is um, around uh, bigger than a 1.5 centimeter square, then that should be allowed. Um, or a five um, a millimeter gradient mean, for, uh, so less than five millimeter gradient, uh, mean gradient in the mitral valve should be allowed. But this will be dependent on the patient and the surgeon. You know, where, you know what the risks are of going back in for a second bypass um, and basically replacing a valve. Okay, what about this view? Is that repair being successful? So I think a lot of you are, are whispering SAM, which I, can, uh, which I completely agree with. There is quite significant SAM here. And I don't know about you, but um, I'm seeing less and less SAM now because we're not resecting um, as much of the posterior leaflet like as we used to, and SAM was often a, often a case of too much resection. So if you resected too much of P2, for example, then you bring the coaptation point closer to the anterior, anterior side of the valve, which is the aortic um, LV outflow tract, and that, that was often the cause of SAM. But now that we're seeing less and less rese resection, and more repairs being done by uh, caudal reconstructions, we're actually seeing less and less SAM, okay? Now, SAM like this is not correctable with fluids or reduction of inotropes, but there are other SAMs that are functional SAMs that you can actually ask the surgeon to go away and you do some manipulations and then the SAM gets better, okay? But this one had to go back to theater. Repair like that. Not very successful either. What, what mitral regurgitation will you allow a patient to leave the OR with? Great. I mean, the surgeon would like it to be zero. Up to grade two. Um, so it, it's still classed as a success, not in the surgical eyes, but it's classed as a success in cardiology if you can redu reduce the patient's MR to less than grade two. I just thought I'd show you a few um, cases of late repair failure. You've already seen this one from Simon, but just shout out so that just, just know that you were paying attention. This is late failure of mitral repair. This is ring dehiscence, yeah, with my, regurg, uh, recurrence of mitral regurgitation, not surprisingly. Okay. Can you see what's going on in this one? Just put my highlighter on it. So there's something flapping in and out, um, prolapsing in and out through the uh, left atrium, and that's, that's basically near cord uh, that is, that is um, ruptured or come off the papillary muscle completely, okay? And that can be very nicely visualized and demonstrated on 3D as well. And this is the recurrence of the mitral regurgitation that is associated with that patient. Now, this is a, a repair, a surgical repair, so it's an Alfieri stitch, which is um, the double leaflet, uh, double orifice mitral leaflet with a stitch through A2 and P2, or a few stitches, in fact. What do you think has happened here? So, the Alfieri stitch has been put through A2 and P2, but this is a five-chamber view, so that is P1. And you've got an abnormality of P1 alongside that stitch, which is causing significant recurrence of the mitral regurgitation. Okay? So I don't know how we're doing for time, but you could just through, run through a few images and see whether you've learned anything or whether the revision's been adequate or not. So, what pathology are we looking at? Are we, is this flail or prolapse? This is prolapse. One leaflet or two? So this is bi-leaflet. This is typical Barlow-type valve with a parachute valve. Everything comes up above the annular line. And both leaflets are prolapsing. But just, if I was to just push you on, on which segments we're looking at at the moment on this view, it's a four-chamber view. You can't see the aorta. A2P2, very good. Okay, this is a commissural view, and you can see that there's something prolapsing through there. 
Now, the commissural view, A2 is actually indeed in the middle, and A2 is fine, but there's something coming up behind A2 that's prolapsing, that, so that's P2, good. This one? A2, very good, flail. This one? It's a commissural view again, so that would be P1, A2, and P3, good. I'm just going to move on just to one picture that you may come across, which is very difficult. And this is a very abnormal valve, but whatever's happening is happening in the background. So there's a major abnormality in the background that's not actually reflected in the valve that you're looking at, uh, the, the leaflets that you're looking at. But if you go to a com the, the view that looks at the posture medial commissure, then you can see that that A3 and P3 are both flailing upwards, okay? And it's beautifully demonstrated on 3D, and this is a, a commissural flail itself, so right in the commissural region. Okay, so these are, these are not uncommon. I'm just gonna skip through uh, these ones because I know we're running out of time, just to show you something else that was mentioned in the remit of this lecture. as uh, another, t uh, an, another example of a type two regurgitation. So what's flapping around through the left atrium? It's a papillary muscle. So that's a ruptured papillary muscle. This causes catastrophic acute MR. And you can actually see it, it's broken off from the anterolateral papillary muscle. Okay, so. I will end there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Anita. Uh, any questions?